This is the story of a man named Gary and all the rockets he built. I can't sing. We're doing the first one. The history of private rocket development starts with OTRAG in 1975. But in America, where it matters, there was Space Services Incorporated. Now, they're better known for the Conestoga launch vehicle, which will be in the next to know your rocket. And before that, there was Percheron. Percheron comes from two minds, that of David Hanna Jr. and Gary Hudson. David Hanna Jr. was a mild-mannered millionaire real estate man from Houston who developed a keen interest in space development after reading a Smithsonian article by Gerard K. O'Neill concerning space habitats. The story goes that he was mesmerized by the idea of living in one and concluded that he and private industry were the ones to build that future. As a result, he made a group called the Space Foundation to build interest. Uh, this was a bit of a dud, except for one guest speaker, Gary Hudson. Gary C. Hudson, a quiet but intense man, was a dropout from the University of Minnesota. Go Gophers. He wanted to study commercial space transportation, but there were no degrees in the field, so he decided to make it himself. This led him to give talks to various companies and groups about the business case for space. It was after this fortuitous meeting that Hudson suggested Hannah start his own company for low Earth orbit satellites that would be cheaper and more to the point than the nearly completed space shuttle. Hudson would design the rocket. Space Services Inc. was born. A verbal agreement was made between Hudson and Hannah to build and test a rocket for a million dollars by July 4th, 1981. I'm not going to go into the details of this part, but feel free to read my references. All I'm going to say is that by the end of 1980, Gary Hudson had a rocket named Percheron. The concept behind Percheron was a launch vehicle made up of low-cost pressure-fed stages that could be clustered, plus a smaller upper stage. From what it sounds like, this was based off a TRW design from about a decade earlier, but I can't find anything on it. There's only one paper that talks about this design. You totally can't find it by using Sci-Hub. Low cost would be achieved through 1. Modularity. Clustering smaller rocket units together and using common components is cheaper than dedicated stages. This also means you have a wider range of performance. 2. Pressure-fed engines. This speaks for itself. While lower performance, they are simpler to develop, build, and operate. 3. Use inexpensive propellants. 4. Have a recoverable payload capsule that contains the vehicle's avionics and other important electronics. 5. Utilize new materials and structure technology to bring production costs down. Also, the idea was to make the vehicle 99.99% reliable, since any extra 9s in the reliability usually meant an extra zero in costs. Theoretically, it could be made cheap enough that losing a launch wasn't as bad as with present launchers. Reusing the payloads with this module was also an interesting idea. I don't know if there were plans to make a more conventional payload fairing. The spacecraft were planned for Earth observation and early communication networks, such as monitoring remote oil wells. The launch pad would be simple too, using hold-down cables to direct the rocket instead of a launch table. Early French rockets used this method, seen here. Pertron's basic design is hard. Here's what the paper says. The module is 4 feet wide and 44 feet long. A spherical pressure tank is at the top and a common bulkhead is used. The engine runs at 300 psi with 75,000 pounds of thrust. Tanks are designed for 350 psi and plan to be made of S2 glass. That's it. The rest I did through simple estimation. First things first, I assumed the interior of the module would look like this. Though, since Hudson has mentioned he planned to switch to storables, it was probably more like Aero-B. By my estimation, the stage looks to contain 28,462 pounds of propellant. Structurally, I assumed the tank would make half the dry mass, leading to a total dry stage mass of 2,000 pounds, or roughly 7%, which fits that curve I made a while back. As for the engine, I estimated the area ratio to be 5. Using C Propep, the engine's sea level ISP is roughly 252 seconds and 278 seconds in vacuum. The upper stage was not defined in the paper. Everything here is what I tried to extrapolate from measuring the rocket diagrams. I estimate around 1,691 pounds of propellant and that the pressure tanks were small enough to be off to the side. The 7% figure was kept for sanity's sake. As for the engine, the rough performance I estimated was 300 psi and 5,500 pounds of thrust, leading to about 312 seconds specific impulse. Three Pertron vehicles were proposed, a single module two-stage system, a three module three-stage system, and a seven module system. Performance figures are based on my own estimates. The single core is easiest to understand. It could toss 741 pounds to LEO and 77.8 pounds to GTO. The three core had the outer two modules act as a first stage, then the middle as a second. 
with the third being the upper stage. This one could toss 2,426 pounds to Leo and 749 pounds to GTO. With the seven core vehicle, the outer six engines would fire, but only four units would be drained using crossfeed. Once depleted, the four would separate, leaving a three core second stage and the upper stage. This one could put 9,360 pounds into Leo and 3,005 pounds to GTO. A test Pertron was built in California and sent to the rocket test site on Matagorda Island, Texas. Matagorda was partially owned by one of SSI's investors, Ted Wynn Sr., owner of American Liberty Oil. The island itself has a great history I recommend reading about. Behind the scenes, there was trouble. Hudson was not a degreed engineer, and his employees were, causing some tension. The Texas team didn't know who was technically in charge. Hudson and Hannah had disputes on how Hudson's company would work with SSI, but that's like icky business stuff. The test launch into the Gulf of Mexico was planned for July, but delays happened, pushing it into August. Before the flight test, there was to be an engine test. On August 5th, 1981, at roughly 6 p.m., the test was to commence. At six seconds before ignition, Eric Larson, an engineer, hit the buttons to open both the locks and kerosene valves. Only the kerosene flowed. The locks valves had frozen shut from condensation. With the igniter flame, the valve thawed and opened, letting flames into the oxidizer feed line. Percheron exploded. The nose cone is estimated to have reached 250 feet. In the ashes of Percheron, David Hanna consulted with industry experts, NASA personnel, and God before switching to an all-solid system, later named Conestoga. Hudson went off to work on his own SSTO ideas. As with all these proposed rockets, we have to ask, would Percheron have worked? On a technical level, there doesn't appear to be anything wrong with Percheron's design. Obviously, the rocket needed check valves, but that's a beginner's mistake. Had the development gotten farther than one destroyed test article, we could say more to the affirmative or negative. Conceptually, there is nothing wrong. Pressure-fed LOX kerosene engines have flown before. Many a student rocket has flown the combination as a first stage. Scorpius Space is, or was, planning to use this type of system on the first stage of their rocket, which looks vaguely familiar. Falcon 1 flew a pressure-fed LOX Caro second stage. Not much more can be said about the design since it was so immature. Propellant crossfeed might not have worked, but no one has attempted that yet. Using storables might be the only issue I see, since the price of NTO increased by about 10 times by about 1990 due to handling and environmental issues, so that would have definitely been a problem. Also, the other denizens of Matagorda didn't want rockets launching and exploding on their island, forcing SSI to go elsewhere. On a commercial level, I don't know how well Pertron would have fared. NASA was done with the shuttle and trying to force payloads onto it, but those ended up bigger than what Pertron was meant for, well, aside from the getaway specials. Of American launch vehicles of the time, Pertron is close to the capabilities of the Delta 3000 series. Assuming Pertron worked, it could have gotten a few government and commercial launches during the 1980s, especially after Challenger failed. The recoverable Earth observation satellite thing is definitely something that they would have developed on their own, so I don't know how that would have fared. Uh, this did get carried over into Conestoga and Comet slash Meteor. Don't know if any launches would have materialized. That's sort of a chicken and egg scenario. Take a closer look at those payload numbers, though. The single module Percheron is an electron class launcher, while the three module Percheron is a scooch under Firefly Alpha. And yes, Hudson has noted he was about 35 years too early for the current market. American private rocket development has a vaguely familiar start, and that start is Percheron. While unsuccessful, it did lead to another unsuccessful rocket and the career of one Gary Hudson. Percheron is the pioneer of private space, far ahead of its time. Percheron! That's a rocket you know.